Thank you, Christian, for uh, making yourself available for this. Um, uh, as, as people probably know, we put out a call for questions yesterday on Sue Today, asking readers, um, you know, what they want to know during this crisis um, and what the, what uh, they thought the mayor uh, could, could help people uh, understand better about uh, how this is affecting the city and what the city's doing to, uh, to help us all get through this. Um, we know uh, there are many questions on people's minds. We got dozens of questions um, uh, submitted to us yesterday and uh, through through last night. Um, we've had to pare those down uh, to what we thought were some of the most pressing. Um, and we're gonna see, and Mayor Provenzano has uh, graciously agreed to uh, to do his best at answering, answering those. Um, we uh, just full disclosure for people, uh, the mayor's office did have a chance to look at these uh, questions uh, ahead of time. This isn't a quiz. The, uh, the idea here is to get the best answers we can. Um, so you know, with that in mind, um, you know, we did allow that where we normally wouldn't do that. Um, but let's get underway. Uh, we had a, a few people ask about fire restrictions, um, a, a ban on outdoor fires uh, at the moment. Um, you know the main the main question is is why is that I uh, and also um, people had asked whether or not uh, there could be some kind of a, an allowance for uh, for just family members who want to have a barbecue to to get through this. So listen, Mike. Before I, I get going, let me thank you uh, and and Derek who uh, is uh, doing all of our audio and video here and the team at Village Media. It's critically important during times like this that we're able to communicate. Uh, and share messages and and the team at Village Media has really been helpful in, in assisting us in doing that. So I want to recognize you and thank you for that. Uh, on to our, our current uh, backyard fire ban. Uh, there's a really good policy reason for it. Uh, the reality is if you're going to have a fire in your backyard, you need a permit. Uh, and to get a permit, our fire uh, suppression officers, our fire department have to go by your house, make sure you have uh, the proper uh, infrastructure in your house, you know, your your fire alarm systems. Um, and right now, uh, for a couple of reasons, we don't want to send them to the homes. We don't want to have them go through homes. We don't want to have them go through the process of checking that out. Uh, we need to keep our fire uh, suppression officers healthy. We need to make sure that uh, none of them are off uh, for COVID-19. Uh, if one officer in one platoon gets COVID-19, we could lose a platoon or half a platoon. Uh, and that's dangerous, right? So we need to make sure that our first responders are all healthy. Uh, the other thing is, is that uh, often, even if you have a permit and you're having a backyard fire, neighbors call. And uh, then we have to deploy. So uh, we would have to actually send people to that call. And there is another opportunity for our uh, suppression officers to get exposed. So uh, right now, um, we're not, as a municipality, trying to encourage behaviors that would either expose our frontline workers to COVID or that would have people get together socially. Right. So, you know, backyard fires, I recognize that, you know, maybe it'll just be you and your family, uh, but sometimes backyard fires attract neighbors and friends. And uh, our main message right now is uh, we all have to stay home and uh, we don't want to, as a municipality, assist and support social efforts that would have people congregate. So those are kind of the three underlying reasons, but really the, the fire chief uh, himself thought it was critically important that he do everything he can to make sure none of his suppression officers get COVID-19 for their own health and safety, but also to preserve the city's ability to fight a fire if we have one. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, uh, next question that we had, um, th and this is something that I think the, the community of Thunder Bay has has uh, been grappling with as well, and, and I'm sure Timmins will, uh, but the, the uh, question of uh, evacuees that we, we typically would see from uh, the James Bay Coast uh, you know, when the snow begins to melt. Um, I know we've hosted people from uh, Kasechewan, um, other communities uh, in, in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, and people have asked us, is that something we're going to be able to, to do this year? Yeah, it's a great question. And we actually haven't hosted evacuees for many of the uh, remote First Nation communities for quite a while. Uh, we stopped as a community doing that prior to uh, me becoming the mayor of the community. Uh, incidentally, completely unrelated to COVID-19, we started looking at that last year on how to assist and support and become a community that hosts evacuees again. And our emergency, man our emergency management personnel at the city have been working with the Office of the Fire Marshal and Emergency Management uh, because there's a process you have to go through. So it's not just a matter of 
you know, they uh, send evacuees to any specific community, any general community. There are specific communities, but you have to go through a process to be one of those communities. And Sault Ste. Marie is looking at that process. There's some commitments that we have to make. So those those commitments would have to go to city council and we haven't got to that level yet. Uh, but I would personally like to become a com community again that hosts evacuees. So that's something I'd like to see Sault Ste. Marie do. I think we're a great community to do it. In the near term, as it relates to COVID specifically, I think the federal and provincial governments are working on uh, specific plans to assist and support those communities. And I think there's some desire in the communities not to evacuate, uh, to stay remote because of what's happening. So I think they're looking at infrastructure and ways to accommodate those communities in and around their community in the event that they do have to be moved from their community. So there's been no outreach to Sault Ste. Marie to assist with this. Um, it's something that the city, I think, would be very open to and willing to consider. Uh, but I, I think the federal government's really focused on supporting uh, those communities and putting plans in place for those communities so they wouldn't have to evacuate them far away from their communities. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for uh, clarifying that. Um, another question that we had, uh, I, th I think a, a number of people ask, and I, and I think this is something that the city has uh, put out some information on already, but uh, mm -hmm. people are curious about property taxes. They're, yeah. they're curious about how, um, you know, these deferrals may work if, if deferrals are available. Um, I know also uh, we had businesses asking, um, you know, businesses concerned about uh, being able to pay their rent, whether, where, whether or not, uh, uh, what, what the city will be offering in terms of uh, deferral of, of taxes. Yeah, so so the rent is is a provincial jurisdiction. So so the city doesn't have much uh, leeway on the rent. But I think uh, to your to your point, Mike, a, a part of commercial rent is often the 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 commercial taxes, the property taxes. So look, uh, the city uh, council at its last meeting uh, suspended any penalty or interest payments on non-payment of taxes for the for the next payment that's due. So if people can't make their next payment, there's gonna be no financial consequence to them for not making it. So if they don't make their next payment, there's gonna be no penalty, there's gonna be no interest accruing on the arrears or the outstanding amount that that is, is coming due. Uh, so that is what we did immediately because we could, and that gives us some immediate relief. Uh, but we want to do more, and there's a number of city councillors who want to do more. Uh, and we will, I'm sure, be discussing that come our uh, April meeting. Our primary focus right now is the health and well-being of the community, which is why you've heard me for the last couple of weeks talk about staying home, staying home, staying home. Uh, and if you have symptoms, self-isolating. So the city has focused all of its immediate resources in supporting Surya hospitals and Algoma Public Health and working with our emergency planning committee. So we have an emergency planning committee that we're focusing our time and our energy on. Um, but we recognize this is going to have significant uh, commercial and economic costs and residential costs. There are people that have tax payments they're going to have to make that are underemployed now or not working. And we recognize that those are challenges. The challenge that we have as a municipality, and this is really important, is that we can't uh, budget for deficits. So you see how the provincial and federal government are just, there's a problem and they're throwing a bunch of money at it. And I don't say that at all critically. Like I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that the federal government's handling it the way they are. And I'm appreciative of the fact that the provincial government's handling it the way it is. And I want to give uh, both Prime Minister Trudeau and his cabinet and uh, his government and Premier Ford and his cabinet and his government recognition for how they're handling this crisis. Uh, but they can they can throw uh, money at something that they don't necessarily have. The municipality can't do that. So if we run a big deficit this year, we can't thereby uh, run that same deficit next year or increase that deficit. We have to make up for it. And we have to balance our budget so that when we pass a budget, this is by law, but this is the municipal act requires us to pass a balanced budget. So if we run a huge deficit and we have to make up for that, that's just going to be a tax increase, right? So like when you squeeze the balloon at one end, the air pops out the other. And like, we don't want to run into a big tax increase. What we're talking about is trying to take it easy on people and give them a break. So we don't want to do things that result in us having a significant tax increase next year. That's not to say there aren't things that we can do. So uh, there are uh, ways we can look at if we do, uh, have a big deficit this year, 
um, evening that off over a longer period of time. You know, maybe we do some borrowing and the tax increase will just be that incremental amount to cover that cost of borrowing. So we need a bit of a clear picture as to what the consequences will be to the municipality and to the PUC. What we're doing immediately, though, is both at the PUC and at the city is going to work with people to give them time to pay. Right. And and so that's those are our immediate focuses and our immediate efforts. As far as uh, tax rebates and tax reductions, those are going to be conversations we have to have, but they're just going to be more difficult to achieve with the policy, with the tools in our toolkit. Um, but there, there's a strong desire on council uh, to give people the biggest break we can give them. And I think that will be much more clear to us in April. It will also be much more clear to us when we have a sense of what kind of support there's going to be for municipalities. We've heard so, a lot. Of, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to ask when when will uh, the city know, um, you know, how much uh, it's looking at in terms of uh, taxes that are not coming in and, and, and how much that impact is going to be? So the, the next the next payment is due, I think, May 5th. Right. So we, we will get a closer idea then of what things look like. Um, uh, but that payment, Mike, we've waived uh, we've waived interest and penalties on it. So we don't expect to get a regular tax payment on May 5th. Yeah. Right. So like this will all become much clearer to us in April, May, June. And then uh, we also need to understand what the provincial government will do to assist and support municipalities. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, policy changes and new policy to assist and support businesses and to assist and support people. And I, those are really positive. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're going to be short, too. And uh, this is going to have an effect on on our budget. And really, like we everything we do comes from the, the residential, industrial and commercial taxpayer. Right. So any program that we want to implement, we can't implement that program by borrowing from the future. And, and then running a deficit to, to put that program in place, that program is carried by our residential, commercial, and industrial taxpayers. So we have to make sure our decisions are balanced and that an immediate decision doesn't have a longer term uh, financial consequence on people. So what I want people to know is that this coming payment that's due, if you can't make it, that's okay. And there will be no financial consequence to you of not making that payment. And I know that there are councillors that want to look at extending that to the next payment. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of agreement on council to that. But we need finance to tell us what the economic cost consequences of that are to us and the financial cost to our budget, because those ultimately are costs that we pass on to you. In the end, they're all the taxpayers cost. So right. um, we 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 are focused on it. Uh, we're working with uh, the other orders of government to figure out what programs they have available that we can connect our our businesses and our our our, uh, our residents to and then we'll see what the fallout is for us and we'll see what we can do but I think this will be there'll be a lot of conversation about this at council through uh, April May and in the meantime all of our residents should be aware our commercial industrial and commercial taxpayers should be aware that the May 5th payment if you can't make it there's no consequence to you for not making it there's no penalty and there's no uh, interest accrued on that payment. So that's essentially, Mike, that's a deferral, right? When right. you don't have to make the payment, it's a deferral. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, I, I, this next question uh, is, is maybe something that uh, uh, would be uh, more uh, related to the provincial jurisdiction, but uh, we did have a number of people ask about this. Uh, people are concerned um, about the, the retail workers at um, yeah. our grocery stores, they're saying, you know, hey, why, why don't we have one day a week where grocery stores are required to close um, to give those people a break and also to assist, I guess, with uh, social distancing? Yeah. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I can. Um, so so you're right to identify that the, the orders that govern people and essentially businesses, they're coming from the other levels of government. So the federal government has a quarantine order in place. And that quarantine order very clearly says that if you are returning to Canada, you have to self-isolate for 14 days. So if I can stop and make that point, because it's an important point. If you're coming in from out of the country, you have to self-isolate for 14 days. It's illegal not to. The vast majority of orders, Mike, are coming from the provincial government. So the provincial government, you know, it, it really has all the authority in the province. And what we do is we follow its orders and we look at its orders and how where their, their orders affect us or we have a responsibility to carry them out, we carry them out. But uh, these essential service orders and store closures, that's all governed by the province. 
So the municipality doesn't really have the authority to go around and say this should close or that should close or this should close. The province is doing that and we're supporting the province. Uh, so grocery stores are obviously an essential service, so they're exempted from the closure order. But as far as how the grocery stores operate on a daily basis, uh, we have to trust uh, the, the, uh, the people operating the grocery stores uh, to do that properly. Uh, we don't, uh, we, they need to clean the grocery stores on a daily basis as opposed to just, you know, one day a week. Um, but we're not, as a municipality, going to dictate to the grocery stores when they can and can't be opened. One, it's outside of our jurisdiction. And two is, is we, we have seen a lot of them really change their behavior and adjust for COVID. And they're all working really hard. And if we can just take a second to thank all those people that work in our grocery stores and are, are making sure that our food supply chain is safe, uh, you know, a lot of us uh, don't have to go to work and people are saying, you know, that we have, because we, we can work from home like you are right now. I can see that you're in your, your living room, right? And that's the sacrifice that's being asked of you. Uh, but those folks have to go. And I, I'd like to just reiterate, for all of us that don't have to go out, when we don't have to go out, we should stay home. Because there's a lot of people that want to stay home to keep themselves safe and to keep their family safe that can't stay home. And if you work at a grocery store, you got to go to work. So I want to acknowledge them and thank them for the hard work they're doing. And I've seen a massive change in our grocery stores over the last couple of weeks and how they're processing people and how they're handling people. So uh, we trust them to kind of have the right uh, schedules in place to, to run the grocery store and keep it open uh, as will best serve the community. They have the expertise in how to do that. The municipality doesn't. So the municipality doesn't really see kind of uh, specifically mandating or trying to mandate, notwithstanding the fact it is out of our authority and it's, it's really a provincial authority when they're open. Okay, thank you for addressing that. Uh, we, we did have a lot, of, a lot of people concerned about that. And I think that maybe just reflects a general concern and and sort of uh, oh, for the, the people who are working at these yeah. stores, which is, uh, you know, no doubt warranted. Um, one question that's coming up now um, that, the, you know, the city does uh, have a stake in is, is uh, summer jobs. I think uh, uh, a lot of uh, college and university students uh, seem to be curious as to yeah. you know, what, what's going to happen with that. I know the city is, has a significant uh, summer jobs program. Um, you know, what, what, what are we looking at at this point if it's, you know, not yeah. too soon to ask? No, no, listen, no, I, I, it's an important question. I'm glad you asked because uh, a lot of students do work for us in the summer and we love that program. We love the youth it brings to city staff and, and we love giving them an opportunity to, uh, to make some money over the course of the summer. And it's really helpful because, you know, we have all these parks and we need the lawns mode and it's, it's, it's great to have students that help us with that. But there's the point. We just received a provincial order that the parks are closed. So will we need students to maintain the parks to the same level or degree if the parks remain closed all summer? Probably not. Uh, but we are, haven't made a decision on our entire program yet. Uh, what we're doing is we're waiting a few weeks and we'll have more clarity about that in a few weeks. Uh, I can tell you and I can tell the community it would be our strong desire to continue on with it. Uh, but we have a number of our own staff that are home. Right? We have a number of our own staff that are not working right now. Uh, we have a number of our own staff working from home. And so we, we uh, our staffing needs will be largely dependent on when we get through this current stage. So the city has essentially looking at this like it has three stages, right? Mike, it's business as usual, which we're not in, right? Then we have a, a real shutdown stage, which everybody's currently in. And then there's going to be an intermediate stage, right? Between this, where we are now and before we go back to business as usual, there's gonna be a transition from us being uh, so shut down to us being business as usual. And we're assessing what that transitionary stage looks like and what our manpower needs are gonna be during it and uh, whether we can and where we can use students. So we hope to have more clarity on that in three weeks. Um, so for all those students who have applied um, that wanna work at the city, uh, sit tight. Uh, we hope to continue, but we're not clear to us right now that we're going to be able to. It's largely going to relate to uh, what our manpower needs are, and that's largely going to relate to where we are uh, in this current uh, stage. Now, one of the things I could say here is we get out of this quicker if we all work together and do the same thing. 
that we get out of this quicker if we stay home right now. But if we don't stay home, if we keep on passing this virus around our community, it's going to take us longer to get out of this stage. So it's critically important that we all buckle down and we all do what we need to do in the interim. And the, the more committed we are, the quicker we come out, the quicker we come out, the better and quicker we get to that business as usual stage. But that's a little far off right now. Well, I think that leads into uh, the next question. And, and I, I copied this one down as it uh, came in. And I think maybe I'll just read it out. Um, sure. So this came from one of our readers who, who said, uh, in my neighborhood, there are kids from three different families playing together. Uh, it's great to see kids uh, outside playing, but in this time, is it a good idea for the kids to be playing with each other, then going back home? Is, a is there a responsibility put on the parents and guardians? What does a neighbor do, if anything? Okay, that's a great question. So uh, to be clear, uh, there's an order and nobody can be socially or publicly in groups of greater than five. So technically, those children, if there's more than five of them playing together, they're breaching a provincial order. So that, that can happen, shouldn't happen, it's unlawful. Uh, the, the police have, are taking a staged approach. So the police aren't gonna show up if they're called in charge, you know, a bunch of 12 year olds for playing, you know, but they will, sh they will educate, uh, they will give a warning and they will go through kind of an escalated procedure where they educate, give a warning. If it keeps on happening, they would consider uh, further action. Um, but so we have to make a distinction, Mike, between the orders. You can't be together in groups of more than five, right, socially or publicly, and the recommendations. So the recommendation that you physical distance, there's no order that's enforcing that. And so I've had people reach out to me and say, you know, I was in a sidewalk and someone walked by me and they were within three feet. So I think the police should be policing that. There's really no way for the police to police that because that's a recommendation. Physical distancing is a recommendation. So uh, great for kids to play together, uh, but if they're not in the same family, not right now. So uh, those kids shouldn't be out all playing with each other. Again, the, the better that we all adhere to the same set of rules, uh, the more we respect those rules and follow them, the quicker we get out of this. So I'd say to all those parents out there, uh, and I'd say to all those neighbors and the family and the friends, you need to talk to each other constructively, um, and you need to talk to each other uh, in respectful manners, but we all have the right to communicate those ideas to each other. And the reality is, is that everybody, no matter your age, should practice physical distancing. So you shouldn't be within two meters of somebody um, that's not in your immediate family. And uh, so that includes playing. So that, that shouldn't be happening. Um, you know, I have, I have three little girls. Uh, one of them is not yet one, uh, and she really likes to play with her sisters, but her two plus sisters play together all the time. And we go outside and they play in the driveway. But I don't let my kids go out in the street uh, and play with the other kids in the street. Um, and I don't see any parents on my street doing the same thing. I see all of them, their kids are playing with their own kids. And, you know, I just moved to a new street. And it's really awkward uh, for my wife and I to be on a new street and to not be going introducing ourselves to the neighbors. And, and I'm well known, right? So they know that, you know, who I am and that I'm the mayor and I, I'm not going and shaking anybody's hand, but they, they get it, right? And uh, when I'm walking around my neighborhood, I'm staying on the opposite side of the street as somebody else walking. And I'm not walking across the street introducing myself and saying hi, but they get it. Um, and I think everybody is starting to get it, but we need, we need to make sure that the people that aren't, we talk to them and engage them. So uh, if you see kids playing, and they're different kids from different families and they're in, in, in there's, there's a group of them, there's nothing wrong with saying to the parents, look, you know, it's important that we have to practice physical distancing. And part of physical distancing is not interacting with people outside of your immediate family. Um, but as far as the policing it, it's, it's actually not in order to do that. It's in an order to not congregate in more than five people, but it's not in an order to keep, keep two meters between yourselves. So there's not a lot the police can do for you there. There's not a lot public health can do for you there. So we all need to talk about the recommendations and encourage each other to follow them. And I have them boiled down in a really simple way. And I've said this hundreds of times over the last couple of weeks. And I'm going to say it hundreds of times over the next few weeks. If you have COVID-19 symptoms, you have to self-isolate. If you don't have COVID-19 symptoms, stay home. If you have to go out, practice physical distancing. 
And that means more than two meters between you and someone else. And you don't interact with anybody outside your immediate family. So those kids who are playing, you understand their desire to play. You understand their need to play. But right now is not the time to play. You got to keep your kids in and around your house and you got to keep your kids socializing with their immediate family. And you really need to reduce uh, the, the communication, the interaction, physical interaction around the neighborhood. Okay, excellent. So, I mean, that leads into um, uh, the next question where people are asking, you know, should I be out uh, walking and biking at this time? Um, it also leads into a, into a, a suggestion that some people have had, but the, to clarify that for people i mean yeah. your understanding is should we be out walking yeah there's there's no there's no problem going out for a walk yeah you can go out for a walk uh my wife and i go out for a walk with the girls uh every day to get the girls out of the house uh but when we go out for a walk we don't get within two meters of anybody else out uh for a walk um and we don't let our girls go interact with uh kids around the neighborhood and we're anxious for those times right? we we want we want our, our, our little ones to like go leave the driveway and go for a bike ride with the other kids in the neighborhood. We want to see that happen. Uh, but we, we, it'll take longer to get there, Mike, unless if we don't all follow these rules. Um, so yes, it's okay to go for a walk, practice physical distancing. So what I'd like to just encourage everybody to do is go to a Goma public house website or go to the city's website. And the city's website, you know, Goma Public Health website, has very clear information on what physical distancing is and how you practice it. So we all need to stay healthy, and we all need to engage, like what you know, go outdoors and get some fresh air and get some sunshine. Uh, go for a walk. Uh, go for a bike ride. Uh, respect other people's physical space. Make sure people respect your physical space. Um, you know, people have kind of walked up to me uh, in the neighborhood, and I, I've politely asked them to kind of step back a bit and make sure there's two meters between us because I'm physical distancing. And I just explain to people what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And people are very respectful of that. So, so uh, I don't want to discourage people from leaving their houses and going for a walk and going for a bike ride. You can do all those things and still respect the rules that Algoma Public Health has for us. And unless, unless you just came back from out of country, you cannot leave your house, right? Like you have to self-isolate. So uh, if you have COVID-19 symptoms, you cannot leave your house. You have to self-isolate. So yeah, point, yeah. yeah. So if it, we're, I'm talking as if somebody is healthy and has no symptoms and, and, and hasn't just returned from, the, from out of the country. If you've just returned from out of the country, no, you cannot go for a walk. If you have COVID-19 symptoms, no, you cannot go for a walk. Uh, so here's an idea that I think I've seen this um, floated around on social media. I'm not sure if other communities have actually done it or not, um, but uh, someone had suggested, uh, passed this along, has the city considered shutting down any uh, streets to allow for this? Um, I think from my own experience, you see you're walking around uh, on the sidewalks and people are going out on the road to avoid each other, et cetera. Um, so some people have suggested, hey, let's shut down a street uh, that would allow for, for, for better uh, you know, social distancing yeah. while walking? Well, um, so no, I don't think the city is going to do that. And there's a couple of reasons for it. Well, before I get into that, you're going to notice, and I'll tell everybody now, you're going to notice we're, we're, we are notwithstanding what's going on, we're starting our street cleaning program now. So public works will be out. They'll be cleaning the sidewalks. They'll be cleaning the streets. Uh, they're all going to do that. They're going to make sure our staff are doing that in a, in a safe way where they're social distancing themselves. But we want to get the sidewalks and the streets clean for people because we want to be able to have them use it. And we also want them to, to use them safely and have space to use them. But here's, here's the, the issue with closing streets. One is we, we, uh, we're operating on a, uh, a smaller staff size right now. So we don't want the additional kind of work that goes into that. But the larger issue, Mike, is that we don't want to, uh, just like fires, do anything at the municipality that encourages congregation. We don't want to do something that would encourage a number of people to go to the same spot. So if we say, I'm just going to pick a street randomly, Spring Street. If we say Spring Street's closed to traffic um, or Spring and Elgin are closed to traffic, uh, walk on them, do what you like to do, or St. Mary's River Drive is closed to traffic. Uh, we're sending a signal to people to congregate on that street and walk on that street. And so we'll be people will be leaving their houses. They'll be, you know, going out and there'll be more people in the same spot and we don't want more people in the same spot we want less people out and about doing things so we think there's plenty of space in this city 
to leave your house and go for a walk and be able to keep two meters from somebody that you're passing, right? So, you know, maybe uh, somebody has to stop and somebody has to go around. That might very well be the case, right? But we don't see uh, open, closing a street and encouraging people to walk on that street as a consistent policy decision considering everything else we're saying right now. And we're concerned that if we did that, we would be encouraging people to congregate. Okay, excellent. Thank you for answering that. I think I've seen that question asked a, a number of times and uh, there's some practical reasons why it, uh, it doesn't yeah. work. Um, here's another one that I, uh, I had, I'd kind of written down as it, as it came in. Um, and I was, I'll just read it. Um, so someone's asking, uh, as an employee working frontline grocery, uh, my concern is for those who still wander for something to do. Uh, we get many people still doing that. Our jobs are important, but our families are already at risk. Some of our community are not taking this illness seriously. How do you plan to get our people to stay home? Yeah. So this is this is one of one of the ways we're trying to do that. I, we have been messaging stay home tirelessly. And in lieu of a provincial order that requires people to stay home, and you know that that may come if if the premier is not satisfied that people are staying home to the degree that the provincial government wants to see them stay home, they have the authority to issue that order. Um, uh, in lieu of that, we have to just keep on doing what we're doing, which is talking about the importance of staying home, and that's why I'm appreciative of of your uh, operation, Village Media, for doing this. It's why we've been doing the radio we've been doing. It's why we're doing the social media we're doing. It's why we're doing the videos we're doing. Uh, we need everybody to work together and we need everybody to help us in this cause. So you need to talk to your neighbors. You need to talk to your family. You need to talk to your friends about the importance of staying home. And uh, I'll boil it down again. The rules are pretty simple. If you have COVID-19 symptoms, you need to self-isolate. If you've returned from out of country, you need to self-isolate. Otherwise, we just want everybody to stay home even if you don't have symptoms. But when you go out, you have to practice physical distancing. But what we have to do, I think we've seen a significant change in behavior over the course of this past week, but we need to keep on commuting this. and We need to keep on getting the message out. And you're gonna see uh, the message coming out from Algoma Public Health. You're gonna see the message continuing to come out from the city channels. You're gonna see the message continuing to come out from my channels. I've asked city councillors to, to do their best to uh, send the message out themselves, but also to, to, to share and reshare our messages from the city and my channels. But all of you in the community can do this. Like everybody in the community, when you see a message on one of my social media channels to say, that says stay home, share it, retweet it, Facebook it. Let's all talk to each other in respectful, constructive, positive ways about why this is important. And the key reason why this is important is the, the, the more of us that do it, and the more committed we stay, the quicker we get out of this. If the virus can't travel from one of us to the other, it dies. And that's what we need to happen. This is a highly contagious virus that we have no vaccine for. But when you get it and you beat it, it's dead. So it's not going to travel from you. Uh, the reality is a lot of people that get it are going to be fine. But there's going to be lo lots of people that get it that aren't going to be fine. And if you, when you read about the virus, you, you'll see that the doctors are saying its range is, is, is incredible. Like it can go from very mild. Someone can get it and it can be very mild. And then someone else can get it and it can be in their lungs within two days and be very aggressive. So it's a very dangerous virus. And we can't get, this is not like getting the flu. And, and, and uh, we can't think about it in that way. It, it, it is three times more contagious than the flu. It travels three times more quickly than the flu. It is more aggressive than the flu. Uh, it, it has a higher mortality rate than the flu. Uh, and we have medicines and vaccines to deal with the flu. We don't have any of that medical infrastructure to deal with this. So all of us have to do our part in leading by example and modeling the behavior we want to do, see and talking to people that aren't engaging in that behavior. Now, for people that are breaching provincial and federal orders, there are legal consequences. So you can br you can bring those breaches to the attention of Oklahoma Public Health, to the attention of Associate Marie Police Services, and the attention of the city. So if you breach an order, there are legal consequences. So if you are congregating in more, like there's five or more people, you're breaching an order. If you come home from Florida and you go out to get groceries, you're breaching an order. 
So we have to make sure that people know what their lawful responsibilities are and we're communicating those. And then we also have to make sure that people are working together to respect the recommendations. And the recommendations relate to social distancing and sorry, physical distancing. And the recommendations relate to staying home if you don't have to go out. So if, 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 if you can help me, Mike, if everybody can help me get that message out there, we just, we really just need to stay home. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, we will continue to, to pass along that message. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I do have one, one more question, uh, that I know has been asked by a number of people. Um, uh, you know, what is the city doing to help people who are who are already um, disadvantaged, already um, yeah. struggling um, at this point? Um, I've I've seen that asked a, a number of times on, on social media um, that this is uh, making situations worse uh, for sure it is. some yeah. parts of the population. So we 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 set up a helpline at the city uh, to 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 actually uh, to have a facility where people can call in and tell us what they needed so that we could try and help them. And I want to recognize Sioux Search and Rescue, who is volunteering and working and supporting our uh, folks at the helpline and helping distribute food. And I want to recognize good work going on at Harvest Algoma, but really the leadership of the DSAP. And the city's playing a strong supportive role in, in helping the DSAP deal with the current you know, COVID crisis. So there's three essential approaches. One is of food security and we're focused on food security so that's getting food to people that need food uh, and getting food to not only um, people that uh, don't have food and need food but people that don't have access to food right that might have the ability to buy food but are 75 and aren't comfortable going to the grocery store because uh, they're high risk so we're trying to identify those people and help them get food resources to them too uh, but there are people that in the community that are food insecure and we're you know a lot of kids in our community Mike uh, uh, because of their socioeconomic lives and just what's available to them, they don't have a lot of food at home, but they get fed at school. School's out, right? So there's lots of kids uh, that that are food insecure. So we're ident we're trying to work with our community partners to identify those families and get food to them. There's great work going on through the school board and Agoma Family Services that we're supporting. The DSAB is doing tremendous work on food insecurity and Harvest Algoma is, and we're reaching out to those agencies and working with them and supporting them. Um, then there's the, there's the issue with uh, people that need our shelter services and that people that are homeless um, or are not permanently homed that need to self-isolate or need to social distance and, and don't have the ability to because they're sleeping on someone's couch. So the DSAB is, is uh, through Mike Nadeau and his team, we're looking to secure some space and some room. So if people need space for their own space, they can put them in that space. The city's been helping them identify that space and secure that space. Um, so um, you have food, you have shelter, and then you have more demand for Ontario Works services. And the, the provincial government has increased some funding, some immediate funding to Ontario Works so they can handle the additional caseload. And we're uh, trying to support uh, Mike and his team in any way we can and trying to connect people to the proper resources so they can access those resources. And on, on the shelter services, I can add that uh, we've recently, at the last council meeting, we agreed to lease the Steelton Centre to for a dollar to the DSAB. And they're they're retrofitting it and fitting it right now, so they have more capacity. So that's that's interesting. I think people will be uh, happy to yeah. know that. Um, yeah, we it's a building we had, and we were obviously aren't looking. Uh, we just we just we were talking to Mike. What can we do? We we had good communications with the DSAB about what, what, where they had immediate need, um, and we rented the city council agreed to rent them the Steelton Center for a dollar, and they're in there now retrofitting it, getting it ready to take more capacity. So tremendous work being done there. And I want to recognize that whole team. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll be following uh, that as that, uh, that project uh, continues. Um, I do want to thank you for, again, for, for sitting down to do this um, and to answer these questions. Uh, like I said, there's, you know, we, we did get dozens of questions, so hopefully we can uh, revisit uh, some of those and some new questions uh, that come up. I'm available, Mike. I will do this as much as you uh, you folks want. Uh, I my 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 only focus and concern and priority is the community uh, and my family. 
And the only thing I'm doing in my life is, is my responsibility as the mayor and then taking care of my wife and my girls. And that's, I'm available to you every day. Uh, I'm available to any of your journalists. I want to keep on talking to you. I want to keep on getting the messages out. And if I could end before we go with two messages. The first is the same one I've been saying through this whole thing. Uh, if you came in from out of country, and if you look, Mike, uh, four of our five positives were travel, three U.S., one Mexico. And the fourth was Toronto. Uh, but that's, you know, that's Ontario. So um, uh, if you came in from out of country, it's illegal not to stay home. You have to self-isolate. Uh, if you have COVID-19 symptoms, you have to self-isolate. And for the rest of us, all we need to do to serve our communities and each other and to keep ourselves safe is to stay home. And there are people every day that are working on the front lines of this, whether they're working in our hospital or our grocery stores or our transit drivers or Sioux Search and Rescues helping get uh, food out to people. Uh, all of those people uh, are going out to help other people. They're going out because they have to. For them, like for them, we should be staying home because we make their jobs easier if we stay home. So I'd just really like to emphasize that and I'd like, I'd like to ask the community to join me in this. And, and if you know people in your lives, whether they're family members or whether they're friends that, that aren't taking this seriously or that aren't respecting the recommendations, talk to them about it. Talk to them about the importance of it and encourage them to follow it. And the quicker we do that, the sooner we'll be out of this. And I want to end by thanking you and all the people who are on the front lines, all of our first responders and all the people that are going to work every day to keep our community safe. And I want to express my greatest appreciation to them.